I'm just delighted to see everybody. Thank you, Mace. It's great to be here. Eve and I are here together. In case you haven't noticed, there's Eve waving. Oh, happy hands. So I'll kick us off and guide the meditation and introduce the slogan, and then Eve will take it from there and um, guide us in Tonglen at the end. So it's a pleasure to be here with her. We don't often get to teach together, and it's always a joy for me and maybe a bonus for you. <laughs> So let's go ahead and dive in to practice and making yourself comfortable, shifting from your daily activities to a more uh, quiet, still place, both inner and outer. <clears throat> of course, uh, the supine position is always a viable position for meditation. Don't judge it. Sometimes it will be your best friend and embrace it as a completely legit way to meditate. The key is to just not fall asleep. <laughs> so either upright or supine is fine. The main point is to make sure the spine is nice and straight. But not rigid, of course, not tense. Aligned with gravity. If you're on a chair, it's nice to scoot forward on the chair a little bit and tilt the pelvis slightly forward so that you're not sinking back and rounding the low spine into the couch or getting swallowed up by your lazy boy chair. <laughs> and allowing your eyes to close at first is a nice way to signal to the body that you're turning your gaze inward. Make sure your signals are off. Your alerts are off. No one needs to talk to you right now. This is just a time for yourself to go deep and to replenish yourself. Breathing in and releasing with the out breath. Soften the muscles of the face, the jaw, the neck, shoulders, all the way down the body, the belly, the hips and the legs. And then wash over the body again. Notice if there's a more subtle layer of tension you can release. Let's take a moment to arouse a personal heartfelt motivation for your practice. It helps to crystallize your intention. It said beginning your practice with a motivation, a prayer, a <clears throat> statement, a wish. It's like having a ballast on a ship. It helps to chart your course. And as Mary Poppins says, well begun is half done. So your meditation is already off to a good start. Feel the flow of the breath <clears throat> in the body, flowing in through the nose or mouth, filling the body, replenishing it, and then releasing with the out-breath, softening not just this muscular structure, but now the subtle body, the organs. the emotional body, where we hold our thoughts, our worries, our anticipations. Feel that soften with the out-breath. <clears throat> I 
And also relaxing the thinking body, the aspects of your physical experience that hold the thoughts, the concerns, the worries, the projections. Notice where you hold that in your body and release with the out breath. <coughs> And we'll spend some time with some simple breath awareness, feeling the full field of tactile sensations as you breathe in and out from the contact of the breath on your nostrils or your throat, all the way down, filling the lungs, feel the diaphragm, the belly, the abdomen, exchange movement with the in and the outflow of the breath. Feel the breath leaving the body, its warmth, the silky texture of the flow of the breath as it moves in and out of the body. Let it soothe you into the present moment. With your experience right here and now. Notice if the mind drifts, it's a, an exercise you're actually here to do, which is to notice and come back. Notice and come back. A light touch, and yet a sense of alertness, of wakefulness within that relaxation. And as an experiment, let's see if we can count from one to 10 without completely losing our connection with the breath. A simple counting technique is just to label at the top of the in-breath, one, exhale, then inhale, a light touch of two, two, Exhale, like this. Let's see. You can remain mindful of the breath from one to 10. A relaxed focus.
Noticing if there's a little more clarity, a little more focus and ease, even just after that. See if you can maintain that. But let go of the counting. Kind of falling in love with the breath. Marry that awareness with the feeling and sensation of the breath, this union of stillness and movement. The awareness is still, the breath is moving. mind's natural proclivity is to wander, wander off, look for entertainment, just gently acknowledging that when it drifts and coerce it in a, with a light touch to come back to the sensations of the breath in the body, the whole global experience of the breath within the body. From the time it enters, flows down, filling the lungs, the torso, the belly, the back. Leaving the body, feel the change with the belly, the lungs, the chest, throat, nostrils, and mouth. Just feel that global experience of the breath in the body and release distraction grasping at fantasy or regret, hope and fear. Release it with the out-breath. And stay, stay with yourself. Give the gift of presence to yourself now and receive that gift.
And now shifting into a more Dzogchen approach to shamatha, calm abiding practice. Slowly begin to open your eyes and allow your eyes to gaze at a comfortable angle just past the tip of the nose. Let the eyes be soft, the gaze limpid, relaxed, relaxing the muscles behind and around the eyes. This practice called settling the mind in its natural state is a gentle shift from the breath as your anchor to the domain or the space of the mind itself. So in a sense, you're widening your mindfulness aperture here. Widening that scope of your awareness to include the space of the mind within which all thoughts, feelings, arise and pass away. So the eyes help to facilitate this as it gazes into that empty space. Feel as if you were gazing into the space of the mind itself. But don't stare. It's more of a feeling. And settling the mind in its natural state entails releasing, grasping, releasing distraction. And let your mind come to rest as it is. Resting in its own home ground. Nowhere to go. Nothing to fix here. Just a continual releasing and opening and resting from the vantage point of awareness rather than the vantage point of thought. So if you feel yourself being fused with thought, notice and release with the outbreath and return to this broad lantern-like consciousness Settling the mind in its natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction. The eyes grow tired or fatigued to just allow them to close, take a rest. And then when you're ready, open the eyes gently again. Over time, you'll grow more used to meditating with the eyes open if this is new for you. This helps us to blend our life with meditation. The eyes are open, closed. It doesn't matter. Soften the gaze. Relax the jaw. Relax the brow.
As we open into a more spacious, natural state of mind, we can see more clearly how immaterial, insubstantial our thoughts are. Whereas when we're more solidified, thoughts have more control and rigidity over our life. So suffuse thoughts, feelings, impressions, memories with this quality of awareness that is all pervasive. It's always there. It's like the air you breathe. In fact, thoughts are a natural effulgence, a creative display of your own awareness. They're not the enemy. They're like clouds arising and passing within the greater space of your own sky-like nature of mind. Experience that. Taste that for yourself. In this practice of settling the mind in its natural state, we don't prefer certain states over the other. It's very different than other forms of meditation. So if fatigue arises, rather than trying to fix that fatigue, just connect with the awareness that is aware of the fatigue, that pervades the experience of fatigue, and rest in that awareness. without preferring or pushing away any experience that arises, whether it's fatigue, excitation, distraction, anger, sadness. View it from the vantage point of this broader, open awareness.
And now check in. <clears throat> if there's any remnant of yourself, your thoughts, that feels like it is meditating, I am meditating, drop it. And just be in your naturalness. You can even allow the eyes to close if that feels good for you and just rest in this natural state of being, not posturing, not tensely trying to do this right or get to some goal. Let go of that gross and subtle form of ego fixation. Let go of the effort. Just allow yourself to be, let yourself be. And now internally, with an internal bow of the head, if you wish to bring your hands together in prayer, this meeting of the sun and moon, the left and right, the yin and yang, this deep friendship of intention and care, and dedicate the merit of our practice, the good energy of our practice, for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. One of my favorite stories of Ananda, who was the Buddha's primary attendant, is that after so many years of attending to and studying with the Buddha, he wasn't awakening. He wasn't achieving what was called arhatship, like all the others around him. <laughs> and he was dismayed. Why Why not me? And the story goes that one day he's meditating and then he grows tired and so he lays down. He goes to release his effort and lie down and it's in that moment of relaxation and release of effort that he wakes up. And so how can we bring that? How can we remember to bring that into our meditation practice? You know, it's quite common that when we come to a, anything, like a spiritual practice, whether it's meditation or yoga, we bring our baggage with us, our neuroses, our, our drive, what we've been taught is the right way to achieve something. We can bring that even into these domains. And in fact, these domains can enforce, reinforce those unintended or un, um, kind of like unilluminated or non-self-aware ways of being. So it's good to check ourselves. Oh, am I, am I still striving here? Am I still stuck in some posturing of meditation or concept of what I think meditation should be? This practice is about even releasing even that, even that, deeper and deeper. So how was that for you? We'd love to hear from you, a few moments for questions or comments. Did you have that moment of like, oh wow, I didn't know I was holding and then release, and what a, what a relief that is. Did you have that? Or not? You can share in the chat or unmute yourself, I think. Chandra, if no one is asking at this moment, um, I'm curious, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the hypnagogic states. Um, so this was a, a more hypnagogic practice for me. And sometimes it was um, more clear and sometimes more muddy. Um, and then a moment mm -hmm. of real bright clarity for quite a while, which was lovely. Um, but it's, you know, especially of course, when we are practicing in the evening as we do in this course, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on working with that dreamlike state? Um, 
Yeah, that's a good one. Um, that one's a bit sticky because it's a little hard to be like, oh, I'm just aware of more. <laughs> and then you're not aware anymore because you're gone. And I think, you know, common teaching, which I love, is that, you know, if you're falling asleep, it means you're tired and you should let yourself rest, right? But, you know, you're in class, you're about to teach Eve. Of course, you don't want to do that. Are there times when we should fall asleep at the wheel, so to speak? So I I remember being in a in a sustained retreat studying with our one of our beloved teachers Alan we always talk about and he was teaching this technique and I was miserable I was having the worst session I don't know it was after lunch I hated those post lunch sessions so tired not only just tired but also um, achy. Sometimes food can make you more achy. And I had just had my first child. I was sleep deprived, still hadn't caught up on, caught up on sleep. And I asked Alan, you know, no, he was guiding the meditation. There are two parts of the story. He's guiding the meditation, and I was in the midst of my utter misery. Like, why am I here? Why do I do this to myself? <laughs> And he said, even if you're even if you're tired, be aware of tired. Don't try to fix it. And mm-hmm. I realized in that moment, I was trying to fix, make it better because I want to be comfy. <laughs> oh, we're always trying to be comfy, aren't we? So in that moment, I got it. I was like, oh, if I release a fixation on the fatigue or the resistance to it or the solidifying it and can open back into that, did you get that more lantern consciousness feeling? then the fatigue doesn't actually feel so heavy and overwhelming and true. Mm -hmm. It's not that we can always access that, but speaking from this perspective, um, that is quite a simple answer. I mean, I think I've heard you say this, I say this all the time, but when it really happens, we never forget. Mm. And that, and we know that we can, we can do that. Uh, apart from that, I don't have any, what about you? What do you think? Um, you know, I've been practicing a little bit with, uh, the Andrew Holacek and, um, Alan instructions on dream yoga, mm-hmm. uh, which is not generally what you, it's what you do before bed, but there is, um, a way of bringing clarity to sleepy states that I found interesting. Cause I also know that, um, fatigue is a mental state as well as a physiological state. And when we're like, oh, I'm so tired, we're kind of giving in. Um, And so being a bit curious about, is there something beneath this idea of being tired that actually is wakeful? Um, And in this practice, I kind of, I found that, which was really, um, was really nice um, to experience as well. And I agree with you, sleeping is also wonderful, but um, I had a nap, so I have no excuse. I think there's just a, a kind of fantasy realm is, you know, there's so much uh, material that we're going through and stimulus on our day to day. So it just, it's an interesting place where it unwinds, but it can be distracting. So coming back to your instruction over and over, it was very helpful. I like how you reframed that. I mean, basically that finding that something, that aspect of yourself that is clear beneath the fatigue is another way of finding that place of resting in awareness not the fixation or the belief or even the the feeling of fatigue so much we have a a a question or two here someone is curious about hypnotherapy um i i don't know much about it um so not sure if i can speak on it um and someone is curious about the open eyes um unless there's a point of concentration So that's a common question for us. Mm -hmm. I have actually done hypnotherapy and it really was wonderful. It helped me a lot. Um, But I have, I'm not like a therapist or a psychologist. I haven't studied exactly what it is about that state that brings about healing. Um, I hope you found a relief or you find relief. You said you've tried it for the first time today. So you'll know tonight. (laughs) I hope it works for you. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. It is a kind of a, 
it, it is similar to the feeling of it is similar to a meditative state but of course there's some different aspects to it and if you're fully hypnotized that's a whole nother thing i never was fully out of it like snap wake up wait i didn't know i was just like jogging in place you know no that never happened but there's like a very subtle um deeper domain that opens up uh, through this hypnotherapy in my experience that's all eve do you have anything to say about hypnotherapy Oh, okay. Really. Yeah. Exactly. Elena's right about. I think it's not grasping the experience itself, right? So you you can witness it, but you're not reifying it or grasping onto the fatigue or the sadness, whatever it is that's coming up. This is total lojong. I mean, if you this is one of the big takeaways with lojong is notice when you're grasping or reifying a thought or feeling, and release that and see what's there. What what is there clarity beneath the grasping? Okay, the eyes open. Eve, do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? Sure. Yeah, I think um, I will say I've been trying something um, recently with teaching online and open eyes meditation of just turning down my brightness completely. So I am um, I am not seeing the faces in front of me. Um, a candle flame is is really a, a lovely focus object for developing shamatha. Uh, so our sustained attention, which gives us really specific qualities of vividness and clarity, and we, we need it for every practice. We need to develop that. But when we're doing this practice of settling the mind in its natural state, it's actually it's not that it's the opposite, but it's more, it's more relaxed and open. So we're not dull and like kind of falling asleep and spacing out. There is still focus, but the focus is much wider aperture. So I, it, I completely resonate with it probably being easier, especially in the beginning to focus on one thing. Um, I actually learned from um, Chandra's uh, partner, this practice of noticing as far as you can out in the perimeter. So I can see my hands here and then I can't see them. Okay, and I actually have my gaze that far open. And then I, and this is a bit of magical thinking. And then I try to put my gaze behind my head just to expand awareness, just to consider and um, have that a bit of playfulness and openness. So I hope that's helpful with different ways to engage with that open eyes. Can I follow up on that before we, we move on? Yeah. So it sounds like when you when you guys are doing it, your eyes are fully open. Mm -hmm. I've, sometimes I've heard people where they do it, where their their lids are kind of like Mm -hmm. it's like they're, you know, like, like they're looking through their lids, but the bottom of their lids are open. But you, so you, the way that you practice is fully open. Yeah, but it's, you're gazing at a downward angle in this technique. It's a slightly downward, but you're not trying to gaze, you're not trying to gaze through your hoods. Got it. So you're, you're, you, so you're, yeah, you, you're looking out, you're seeing, and then, yeah, but just being soft about it. And okay. Yeah. It's an interesting state because it's not like you're glazing over like when you're spaced out. It's not like that. So there's there's a degree of clarity even with the vision, but it's a, a broader clarity. I love that. Thank you for the reminder, Eve. That did everybody do that? That's such a cool thing. <laughs> Bring your arms out to your sides and just see if you can see what where you can see. Bring them forward a little bit if you have to. Yeah. That's that lantern consciousness mm -hmm. feeling. You know, you have the spotlight consciousness and the lantern consciousness. So this practice is very much about that kind of diffuse light, diffuse mm -hmm. vision. This this phrase is commonly said, imagine you can see a full 360 degrees around you, like what Eve said, see behind you too. It does something, it changes something. And it helps to dissolve the illusion of outer and inner and that you can only meditate when your eyes are closed. Because it's equally as important to blend your meditative state with the post-meditative state, to bring it into your life, not to leave it on the cushion where you had your eyes closed. Can you meditate? Can you be aware and mindful and present with someone who's talking to you or driving in your life? Someone asked about the fire casino, and my recommendation is to... Um, listen to Michael Taft's podcast. He has about, I think, two or three in a row um, on the Fire Casino um, with Daniel Ingram. And um, 
you know, I have not practiced it. It uh, seems to be have kind of um, almost outrageous um, impact on people. And it sounds interesting if I if if one day or another we all get the opportunity to practice in person again, please. Uh, that's that's something I would like to investigate. Um, I think it's those highly concentrative states. Um, and of course, you still have to come home and do the laundry and be nice to your cat and all that. So I, I think there's <laughs> there's a both and. We'll always need the lojong, even if you excel in the fire casino, which is a type of practice. Yes, yes. It's kind of more of a, a Theravada earlier style so we don't learn it so much in the tibetan style it's not that it's not completely valid but it definitely is uh, not as focused not as emphasized so brian says i have trouble tuning into the pure awareness behind the various objects of my mind meditation any tips on tuning into that state so um i'll, I'll start this eve if you want to add that's great too i um One common analogy used in this style of meditation is that awareness is like the sun and the sun rays are like thoughts, right? So these thoughts are creative displays or effulgences from from the sun, you could say, from, from awareness. And so in this type of meditation, rather than kind of doing what we might habitually be doing throughout our day, which is like, oh, I want to eat. Okay, I'm going to go over here. Oh, there's a phone call. I'm going to go over here. And we're all kind of, we're always in a sense kind of face planted or fused with thoughts and identifying with them, operating our life from the vantage point of this thought, I like this, I don't like that, right? The I, 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 often the I maker, the ahankara is often in there running the show. We'll talk about this in a moment. And uh, so this practice is about, in a sense, kind of leaning back into more of the source, right? The sun, you could say. So you're leaning back into that, that source of the effulgence of all these appearances, and you're resting from that place. So the eye open is very helpful because it's like you're watching a play of the thoughts coming and going and entering and exiting and fighting it out or making love or whatever they're doing. You're watching like, um, sometimes I like to think of like I'm a non-attached director. <laughs> you know, like I'm witnessing, but I actually don't really care if they're good actors or bad actors or if people applaud or not. You know, I'm just sitting way back in the back row and I've got this vast, this kind of peripheral awareness of the whole theater and then the stage. And so I'm no longer fused with the thoughts, but I'm actually, I have space. There's space between my awareness, my experience, and those thoughts that are coming and going. And what's cool is that it's not like um, detachment. It's not like you're training to be Teflon and non-reactive, non-feeling robot. That this practice isn't, meant to create that effect and in my experience it doesn't create that effect what it does is it opens the capacity to more easily and adeptly be with whatever comes your way lojong so maybe that's enough for now i hope that's helpful so that feeling of leaning back in your experience broadening it and not being so fused with the thinking mind see if you can enhance the space between your awareness and the thoughts. And then you start to see that the space actually pervades all of those thoughts. They're not separate things. Mm. And you don't have to go outside to find space. Space is in the body. We are 99.99% space. I looked it up. <laughs> Scientific magazine. I'm not making that up. We are pervaded by space, not just the mind, the whole body. Space is everywhere. Okay. We love your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, we have an agenda. <laughs> we have a slogan to impart. Woohoo. 
Okay, you've pasted it. I'll get us started in a timely manner. <laughs> and uh, do my best here, Eve. Okay. I, um, this one is very interesting. Give up poisonous food. The Tibetan is Dukchen Gize Pang. Not easy to pronounce the way that they spell. Um, Dukchen is anything that has suffer, suffering or poison. Gize is like food. It actually, the word ze is that which you eat or take in. Bong means to abandon. So give up, give up poisonous food. But of course, this doesn't just refer to our diet. We're not going to talk about nutrition tonight. <laughs> in this context, poison here in the lojong context, the mind training context is self-grasping self-importance. That's the poison. So as you know, if you make a meal, a beautiful meal, but you put just a tiny drop of poison in it, then the meal is ruined. Yeah. So in this context, the meal is your bodhicitta, is that, that awakened mind, that compassionate heart. And the poison is self-importance. So just a little bit of self-importance in the beautiful meal, buffet, banquet of bodhicitta, these teachings say, poison it. It changes it. So it doesn't mean that because you're self-centered or you have such self-centered thoughts, you're bad. It's not like that's not what we're saying poison is. Of course, we all have those, and we can't control those from arising. But the idea is to not be fixated or reify or grasp onto them. I can have a thought, oh, I'm jealous of, of um, so-and-so because they're so amazing and I wish I was like them. We can have that thought, but then we can also recognize, oh, that's just a thought. <laughs> or who's hosting that thought, as Eve beautifully shared with me earlier on a call today, who's hosting that thought? I love that. You know? And so... Um, make sure to check in on your motivation. Of course, Buddhism, Dharma is always talking about what's your motivation. And by doing that, by it, one way or two ways we can do that is these classic meditative techniques of mindfulness and introspection. Dren Dang Zhejin. Mindfulness is remembering to be present, to be alert, remembering, oh, who's hosting this thought? Remembering to ask yourself. And then introspection is that it's like posting the sentry at the gate, watching out for these things coming and going. My competitiveness, my jealousy, my fear, my feeling of lack or fear of abandonment. Just, we all have those. But we have to be careful not to fuel them and feed them and fixate on them. So food, of course, is the, is the bodhicitta. The poison would be self-centeredness. But we can also think of this line as, what do we take in through all the senses? What do we take in through the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the nose, our touch sensation, tactile sensation? All of this is food. And what's interesting is that in Ayurveda, which is the ancient healing modality of India, and many Buddhist teachers and practitioners were uh, involved in Ayurveda, were Ayurvedic physicians and so on back in the early days. Um, Ayurveda says that everything that we can digest is considered food. So whether it's media, someone's vibes, <laughs> you know, or input, whatever we're taking in and can be digested into our system is considered food. And what aids in digestion is considered medicine. Now, on the other hand, what hinders digestion is poison. So that's another interesting way to understand that digestion equals integration. So poison kind of blocks, blocks the integration or blocks um, the chi. It's not in harmony with what the body mind matrix wants to do. 
Okay, here's a, s- a quotation from Jamgun Kongtrul the Great. I can also paste it for your reference. He says, Since all virtuous thoughts and actions motivated by clinging to a concrete reality or to a self-cherishing attitude are like poisonous food, give them up. Learn not to cling but know the phantom-like nature of experience. This phantom-like nature of experience is the illusory nature of experience. That things arise, hopes, fears, they arise, but they are not solid in and of themselves. They don't exist wholeheartedly, autonomously from their own side. That everything is interrelated. Oh, thanks. The wrong cut and paste. Okay, thank you. So abandon this self-cherishing attitude, this clinging onto concrete reality. Abandon that, because it's like poison. And if you think about it, it is pretty toxic. So learn not to cling, but know the phantom-like nature of experience. So you can play, dance in this dreamlike nature of reality. Okay, so last thing I'm going to share is that in cultivating bodhicitta, there are two things that we need to be aware of and to pacify, overcome, heal. The first, and evil paste it, is called self-grasping. We've been talking about this. This is called dak zin. Dak means self, zin means to grasp. The second is self-cherishing, or che zin. Che is um, is this way of like, it's a cherishing form of grasping. So the first one, self-grasping, is the base confusion that we think, because we think that we exist autonomously. We grasp onto the separate sense of self. This is fundamental Buddhist teaching. This is why we suffer, because we grasp onto this solidly self-existent, autonomous self and yet it doesn't exist so the object that we're grasping here is the self and we take it to be something that exists independently from its own side but in fact under kind of deeper analysis the five skandhas these kind of classic teachings we realize that what we think of as a self actually doesn't exist that we are a combination of various interconnected phenomena, experiences, karmas that come together to create this illusory sense of a solid identity. So we take ourself as the starting point here. We think me and I, and we project that onto a sense of self. So that is self-grasping, and that's the first thing that needs to be overcome. The second of self-cherishing, or chedzin, is based on the self-grasping, based on this feeling, this assumption of I and mine. From that basis comes this chedzin, self-cherishing. What do I want? This gives me priority over others. We want good, we want to avoid bad. I'm more important than you. My desires are more important than yours. So in this fundamental teaching of Lojong and Bodhicitta, it says that we need to overcome these two main confusions. How? Through altruism, through compassion, through mindfulness, introspection, through study and practice. And also through understanding and studying and meditating on emptiness the lack of intrinsic existence of self and phenomena, and also understand that everything is interdependent. The term for that is tendril. And it's said that if we can overcome or uproot this fundamental confusion, then we are free of samsara, that we no longer suffer. Okay. So... 
Eve, what do you think about that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the way you're, you're weaving in this slogan as it relates to all slogans, right? There's such a, there's such a, um, a continuity. I, I was caught off guard by this slogan uh, at first because don't eat poisonous food just is a, is a bit bizarre. Um, and one of the readings of it by, um, by Alan Wallace, and he says, if we engage in our spiritual practice, um, as we engage in our spir spiritual practice, we pollute, we pollute our spiritual food with poison by remaining unaware of self-grasping and the egotism of self-centeredness that derive from it. And I think, you know, what I started really noticing about this slogan is reminding us that we can use anything anything into ac accidentally becoming fodder for our, our egoic identity project. And that we can use even these spiritual teachings, even this amazing meal of bodhicitta, um, anything that we receive in the purpose of, unfortunately, um, trying to keep that whole cycle of hope and fear alive. Um, so another, another um, reading of this by Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, he, um, you know, he says that if we are, even if we're engaging in wholesome actions, so even if there we are packing up wonderful lunch foods to bring to our neighbor who um, is really in need and not well, if we do so with this sense of, gosh, I'm such a good person, this is, I, I hope someone's watching, right, that we can kind of contort even that really wholesome deed. So this abandoned poisonous food, it's actually inviting us to see when are even our more, most wholesome aspects, putting food in our body, the spiritual practice. And I love this Ayurvedic approach that everything we imbibe is food, right? Whether it's the environment that we're in, um, or like, as you're saying, the media, the books, the movies, the, all of it is food. Um, and it can be unfortunately co-opted again for our own identity project. And this just, this really reminded me of um, this wonderful book. Maybe some of you are familiar with Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by the late great Chogyam Trumpa. Um, and he, <laughs> this whole book is essentially about this slogan in a lot of ways. It's really, um, it's a treatise a bit on how we can inadvertently make our spiritual practice just another thing that we own, that we do, just another thing crowding up our very overcrowded lives. And he says that um, the whole point, I love this, the whole point of our spiritual practice is to step out of the bureaucracy of ego, <laughs> which I think is hilarious, right? Because you think of like, wh what would that mean, the bureaucracy of ego? All these different um, kind of forms to be filled out, all these procedures and protocols to kind of keep, again, this big identity project going. Each day we have to show up and somehow be a better, newer, more impressive version of ourselves to keep up with the fears that we're not facing and we're not being with, right? The whole egoic project is to help us avoid, uh, as Pema Chodron calls it, the soft spot, the tenderness, the vulnerability of being with the realities of this world, which are that there is a lot of suffering and uncertainty. And so this whole huge project of trying to avoid that fear, we can, we can actually even endeavor to bring wholesome things to that project, right? Such as the teachings. All of us here tonight believe the teachings are worthwhile. It's a, it's a wholesome thing for us to endeavor in. And yet we actually have to be vigilant even here in the teachings of not becoming a bit co-opted, not using the teachings just as another way to kind of further our egoic project. So there's one, another, one beautiful quote I'd like to read to you, like, cause, okay, I'm, I'm not supposed to do this, but, but how, how do I receive spiritual teachings and not make them into just another item, right? Um, so Chogyam says, there is a saying in the Tibetan scriptures, knowledge must be burned, hammered, and beaten like pure gold. Then one can wear it as an ornament. So when you receive spiritual instruction from the hands of another, 
You do not take it uncritically, but you burn it, you hammer it, you beat it until the bright dignified color of gold appears. Then you can craft it into an ornament, whatever design you like and put it on. Therefore, Dharma is applicable to every age, to every person. It has a living quality. It's not enough to imitate or your master or guru. You are not trying to be, become a replica. The teachings are an individual personal experience right down to the present holder of the doctrine. And that's such an empowering message as well, right? That these teachings are not ours to just passively receive. These teachings are here for us to really test out, to investigate. And interesting that that might help us avoid this practice of them just feeding our ego. So of course, this has slowed down a bit in, in our uh, pandemic times, but um, during most weekends in the Bay Area, you could attend, I don't know, 40 or 50 spiritual workshops. You could get how many different kinds of, you know, um, trainings and experiences. Many of them, if not all of them, really enriching. But there's this kind of tendency that we might fall into of the of way that we approach them ends up actually becoming an ego project. I just need to get that one training and, and then this training and uh, I'll buy a nice shawl at one training and I'll get this beautiful butter lamp at another training, right? So we end up treating it um, as though it's a thing or something to own. Um, and so the idea of like, how do we disassemble this materialism um, around, especially our spiritual practice and it's, it's, uh, it's humbling. It's, it'll be leading us well for our practice of Tonglen. It's to surrender all of our hopes and fears and to march directly into disappointment. So with the spiritual practice, another way we get kind of caught up into, you know, co-opting it into our egoic project is I want this thing because it will make me feel good. I want to do this thing for it to help me. And there's an agenda there's an expectation and in some ways a rigidness and unwillingness to open fully. And the opening and the fullness of that opening, it's, it can be really painful and really tender. Um, interestingly, uh, Chogyam in this book also points out that we can even create a materialism, a spiritual materialism of our Sangha. We can get like a little, instead of interdependent, codependent, Dependent, right? We needing one another in order to justify our own practice. And he has this beautiful image of we don't lean on each other to the point that we would fall, but we walk together on the path, joining one another. And one other thing this brings up for me, just the spiritual materialism, a bit of an aside from the from the slogan, but I think related is this tendency we get to kind of create a distinction between when is our spiritual practice and what is not. And I, I know for myself, my challenges at work, disagreements with coworkers, my chores, the laundry, that is definitely not feel like it is my spiritual practice. And definitely something I, I almost, I try to kind of separate from the rest of like I do it quickly. I just want to get it done with. Let's not worry about that. Let's not talk about that. Um, and that's another way that we're accidentally kind of limiting um, what our experience of spiritual practice can be. Um, so when we think of integrating our practices um, into everyday life, I'll read you just one more quote here. Chogyam says, we must begin to dismantle the basic structure of this ego we have managed to create. The process of dismantling, undoing, opening up, giving up is the real learning. How much of this ingrown toenail situation have we decided to give up? Most likely we have not managed to give up anything at all. We've only collected, built, adding layer upon layer. So the prospect is very threatening. So he says, we have to commit ourselves to the pain of exposing ourselves, taking off our clothes, our skin, our nerves, our hearts, our brains, till we're exposed to the universe. Nothing will be left. It will be terrible, excruciating, 
but that's the way it is. <laughs> he he never is um he's never taking the subtle path. But I, I still I really enjoy um I guess I would say his truth saying of how hard it is to let go of this egoic project. For many of us, most of the time, it's not even conscious. The way that we're kind of ending up using spiritual practice or other things that could be quite wholesome to try to protect us away from what we're afraid of. Um, so I think I, I'll see if there's any questions here. I want us to have a moment. This is quite a, um, I'd say, a bit of a, a dense and a high aspirational teaching for us to, to let go of ego clinging. Anyone thoughts or reflections? There's a, another um, closely related term by John Wellwood, really wonderful um, teacher, therapist, um, which is spiritual bypass, a close cousin of spiritual materialism. And the bypass is when we use our spiritual practice to avoid our neuroses <laughs> and kind of sublimate them, uh, which it's unbelievably effective, in fact. We can kind of become slightly less of a jerk towards those we love without truly doing the deep work of disassembling the ego. Any questions or reflections on this practice? Sorry, this slogan. I'll say something. Yeah. This slogan makes me bummed out because like the idea that, so, okay, let me turn this into a question. The Bodhisattva vow is the impossible vow. It's not possible. It might not even be possible to end my own suffering this time around, right? But we take it anyways and we dedicate ourselves to it. And then the slogan is like, and you're gonna fucking poison it because you're a human being. So that stopped being a question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I like, think that's how will you reconcile that. Because I think, I think the slogan is a warning. I don't think it's a directive. I don't think it's a, it will always be that way. But like, we, we're human. Like, we just, I mean, I'm not Pema Chodin. Like, I'm not, my ego clinging has long, it's just not shed yet. But isn't there like a difference between like ego clinging and just like a, a, a healthy functioning ego? Yeah. That is a very good question. And, and you know, when we say ego clinging, I think we're talking about the, the, con the constriction, not the initial part of, gosh, I'm scared that there isn't enough. Uh, Chandra and I were talking about scarcity earlier, which I think is a very egoic um, mindset, right? Where I want to be generous, I want to be open, but I'm, I'm nervous there's not enough. And if we bring awareness to it, we're doing the work. So it isn't not to feel the scarcity, it's to not act on it. So the food is still there, right? We just don't want to poison it. Right, so Walt says, unless you admit there's a problem, you can't address it. And I think, you know, I, I brought up the spiritual materialism because I, um, it's such a it's such a big issue, unfortunately, and we live in a marketplace now, right, where meditation and mindfulness is is a product. So how do we keep our practice something that feels um, it can be it, we can have nice things and, and, and nice shawls and, and all the rest. But how do we keep ourselves clear with ourselves on that motivation or intention? I have a quick question. It's just, it's interesting to me because I don't find myself to be a particularly, hmm, I guess the word I'm thinking is generous. There might be a better word, person. So what I do is I try to do intentional acts 
of say generosity or giving and you said something about doing it and then thinking gosh I hope somebody sees me or or to feel better and I guess I'm just doing it for the sake of generosity is that but it doesn't necessarily always feel like it's really my true nature I'm doing it to practice the act and I guess I'm questioning how that goes along with do you, is that still I mean is it I mean do you do the act and then hope that eventually it just comes more naturally is that making yeah. sense based on no, the thing you said Laura you're on to it that is exactly right some there are many of these practices that don't come naturally for us and you know as as Chogyam was saying we kind of have to um really both surrender to that reality and then kind of open ourselves up to it and I think you're you're exactly right in saying it can start as something that feels effortful and then become something that feels more reflexive. So you can start with, I'm doing this generosity because I believe it's the right, um, I believe it's the right thing to do, even if it's not my intrinsic motivation. And, you know, you can call that enlightened self-interest, right? Like I know this is good for me, generosity, actually altruism is good. It is like, physiologically good, psychologically good. And I think the hope is that, you know, going two slogans back, that you don't have an agenda about what happens. So right. I'm not being generous without this hope of fruition, without, and right. someone will see me or this person will owe me something. Um, oh yeah, that's not, no, no, that's obviously, <laughs> that would be different. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks for the question. Walt says, vaccine envy is poisoning my food right now. Like I'm 72 with underlying conditions. Where's my vaccine? I hope it comes soon. Yeah, and that's good. That is good, clear seeing, right? Of how, um, well, I don't know if that's ego clinger. That's just like wholesome protection. What do you think, Chandra? I think that's wholesome protection, <laughs> but you can have that thought, but then I think the subsequent suffering, like if it really eats away at you or it turns into negative mental state that goes on and on and on, um, that, that could be the grasping coming in and perpetuate kind of poisoning the, the food. But yeah, you want to preserve yourself. I mean, it's not like it's bad to want to live, right? It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm clinging it, at my ego because I want to live. We're not saying that. No, it's, it's, it's more to the point of, wait a minute. There are these other people out there, and they're getting their, vaccine, their vaccinations. Why am I not getting mine? How right. come they're getting vaccinated and I'm not? No, I understand. I understand. I That's, totally get that, it. That is unwholesome. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and it is, um, it, you know, I think it's how do we, again, open up to um, the very real fear. And I was saying to Chandra, I've been, I've been working with some practices by a teacher by the name of Tenzin uh, Wagyal Rinpoche, and he really invites us to notice where are we hosting the fear or how are we hosting the fear? Um, so it's the fear, which is real, of the vaccine is something that is needed, especially with underlying conditions and et cetera. And, but how are we with it? Does it then lead to that kind of contempt or judgment um, or to um, hopefully self-protective behaviors? So I think this is a great segue for us to do a brief Tonglen. And this is actually a Tonglen for our fear or the fear that helps us uh, maintain our driven ego, the fear that sometimes really just wants to protect us, but it ends up keeping us walled up. So let's just gently close our eyes softly, inviting a quality of gentleness throughout the body. And as a, a first act of generosity or kindness towards ourself, just relaxing and releasing tension throughout all the muscles in the face, softening through the eyelids, cheekbones and jaw.
And for one moment, just really taking in and opening up to the spaciousness that Chandra invited us to be exploring together. In the sense that in this human body and mind and our awareness, there's just a lot of fluidity. Thoughts, memories, images, and sensations can come and they can go. And within the spaciousness, connect to a sense of basic, genuine warmth. That simple impulse for caring that makes you maybe want to scratch an itch somewhere or move the adjustment of your legs. That impulse for caring, which brought you here tonight to be in community, working with these teachings. As my friend and teacher Tenzin Choki says, look at it as your inner pilot light. This flame of care right there at the ready. So with this spaciousness and warmth, just open up to the fears, the uncertainties, the insecurities. just beneath our desire, our egoic intentions. Sometimes we clearly see our ego trying to make ourselves feel better, more superior, important. And then we look just behind it and there's this fear, this worry of not being lovable or good enough. So generate just a simple sense of that fragile, fearful holding. And see if you can give yourself a little space with it invite some warmth along with it. It can be uncomfortable to really open up to and face these anxieties and uncertainties. So let's use the breath to help us move through. As we draw in, we draw in with this intention of transforming these challenging and limiting beliefs about ourselves. And as we exhale, we exhale with compassion and care, a deep tenderness and caring for our own well being. Inhale, drawing in, exhale, extending compassion. Our beliefs may be unique to us, our specific version of what isn't quite right, what we think deserves more attention or improvement in ourselves, but recognizing that each of us has some sense, some deficiency or lack that we are afraid will be discovered, found out. And it's our fleeing from that fear that makes us cling towards and run from all the external events that come into our world day after day, exhausting us in this samsaric cycle of creating refuge in the outside world. So let's give ourselves this moment of tenderly opening to those fears and creating, deepening this inner refuge.
A couple more cleansing breaths, drawing in here the challenging, difficult, fearful content, transforming it immediately through the space and warmth and extending out compassion, care, and love. And then to dedicate our time together this evening, we expand the sphere of our concern and care, imagining everyone, every being who experiences this sense of worry or fear, imagining this impossible imagining that we could take all of that in, relieve even a tiny bit of burden from the fears and insecurities transforming them instantaneously, and then exhaling. May all of us know the true and deep inner refuge. May all of us know safety and belonging. May all of us be free. Thank you all for your practice and your presence. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Mason, Pamela. Thank you, Eve. Thanks, everyone. Um, somebody's asked, does the book Intelligent Heart interpret the Lojong slogans? Yes, it's a very good book. It's a more recent uh, teaching on the Lojong I like a lot. Maureen, OK. I have direct questions. Sorry to take up. <laughs> we don't know when we're doing Feeding Your Demons next, probably in about a month. So definitely stay on the San Francisco Dharma Collective email list. Maybe tell your friends to get on that if they're curious or the IG page. They post every week. Great. I thought I'd let you know if you guys, if you're stuck at home, not doing anything special this weekend, I've got a really cool weekend uh, workshop coming up. It starts at noon on Saturday and Sunday. So it's like, it doesn't take up your whole day and it goes into the afternoon. Why am I? Anyway, yeah, let me just uh, paste this for you if you're curious. I meant to mention this at the beginning, but I neglected to do so self-promotion not our strong suits Chandra <laughs> yeah I know we're definitely not good at that. we need other people to promote us please <laughs> but uh yeah it's a wisdom rising oh. it's the Dakini mandala and then chanting in kirtan with Nina Rao it's fun wow that sounds really fun yeah and it's at Menla which is such has such many very cool classes too yes check out the website even if you can't come to our weekend they've got a lot of really great stuff going on retreats. It's founded by uh, Robert Thurman under the auspice of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's a wonderful organization that could, that supports the cultural preservation of, of Tibetan people. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eve, for a wonderful night. We'll see you again very soon next week. Ciao. You can unmute, say goodbye if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Andra. Everybody.